So, how many of you have ever gotten lucky? No, not like that, but good for you. I mean, how many of you have ever found money on the floor of the grocery store or found the prime parking spot in a crowded lot? So, what is luck and what makes someone lucky? Is it about risk taking? Is it just about luck? And how do odds factor in? So, I'm not a statistician. Math has never been my strong suit. I was a journalism major. But my grandfather was. And from a young age, he always taught me to consider the odds. He thought statistics were so important, they were like the holy grail, that he even had me audit one of his college courses when I was in high school, which, if I'm being honest, was totally boring. But I was happy to do it. Unfortunately, he could have never prepared me for the odds that I would face in the years to come, when there was no but to place but on myself. So I'd like to share a story with you about a world seemingly balanced by a swinging pendulum, and how its swinging has perhaps made me the world's luckiest unlucky person, because everything that wasn't supposed to happen did, but I'm still here to tell you about it today. Shortly after my 25th birthday, I was given a cancer diagnosis, Hodgkin's lymphoma to be exact. And I'm being honest, I actually handled the news pretty well, probably because I was 25 and totally naive. But all the doctors told me that I had over a 90% survival rate. And even though I'm not good at math, these were odds I knew I could get behind. But two months into my treatment, that pendulum was yanked back. And my cancer was not responding to chemotherapy. In fact, instead of shrinking, it was growing. This was the first time I truly felt my own mortality, and most importantly, the fear and pain that my family and friends would feel if I weren't to survive. What would my mom do each year on my birthday? How would my sister and brother feel knowing I'd never meet my unborn nieces and nephews? Who would my cousin travel with? And who would my best friend call four to five times a day? It was these fears that motivated me to become relentless, and my job now was simply to stay alive. So, I began to march to conquer cancer land. I was a Jewish liberal living in New York City who was totally addicted to bagels and cream cheese, and I was yanked out and headed to Houston, Texas. It was there that I was to undergo salvage chemotherapy and an autologous stem cell transplant. Now, for those of you who don't know what salvage chemo is, it's like regular chemo, but on steroids. It just totally blasts you. And after the very first treatment, I literally no longer recognized myself in the mirror. It sounds cliche, but it was true. I endured five months of salvage chemotherapy just to gear me up for my autologous stem cell transplant, which marshals your own stem cells. I spent a month in isolation and was practically knocking on death's door but I was too sick and too weak to even care. After what seemed like an eternity, I was free at last. But during my tenure in Texas, I made and lost my dear friend Kristen to esophageal cancer. My mom was diagnosed with breast cancer. I felt that my misfortune was literally just like spreading cancer. And I wasn't sure how much further that pendulum could go back without just snapping. I returned to New York, but I had left one person and come back another. I was surrounded by friends and a boyfriend who tried to be supportive, but how could they understand the crippling fears of dying I faced every waking minute? They kept telling me I was strong and such a fighter, but if I'm being honest, I didn't feel like a fighter. I didn't feel like I fought any harder than my friend Kristen who passed away. I feel like I just got lucky. I was now given a 75% chance of survival, but I never really felt like cancer was done with me. I spent hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars in therapy trying to see if my fears were justified. And a year later, it turned out they were. I relapsed. Whether the odds failed me or my luck had run out, it didn't matter. I was headed back to Houston, Texas. 
This time, doctors wanted me to undergo a second stem cell transplant, but from a donor. There are 14 million people on the worldwide registry, and not one suitable match for me. What are the odds, right? Or just another stroke of bad luck. A second option was to do a haploid transplant, which is a transplant from a half-match donor, typically found in a family member. Doctors found a suitable match in my estranged father, but once again, my case defied all odds, and he declined to donate. And it's still hard for me to say that. I feel like the universe tried to balance this out with my mom's tireless dedication and relentless towards me back then, now, and forevermore. But it didn't change the fact that I was facing the worst odds of my life. Doctors now said I had less than 20% chance of survival. So I enrolled in a clinical trial. I had nothing to lose and everything to gain. And this drug made me as sick and tired as regular chemotherapy required full body scans every six weeks, which is a ton of radiation, and constant platelet transfusions. But miraculously, somehow, it put me in remission. Doctors told me I was one of two people known to achieve this. I guess you could say, I just got lucky. Now, we didn't know if this drug would keep me in remission and whether or not I should stay on it, so we took a gamble, and for the first time, we were in a position to maybe do so. So we decided to try proton therapy, which at the time was a new form of radiation, in hopes that it would maybe keep me in remission for good. I spent seven months that time in treatment and was still in complete remission. But now came that hard part, finding balance, and not just living life scan to scan, but living life for its own sake, and not feeling as though I had to rely on luck to see me through. It's been nine years, and I'm still alive. Thank you. Thank you. And my doctor and I will never use the word cure. I think we're both a little superstitious, and I don't think I'll ever fully move on from having cancer but I've done a really good job moving forward. I left New York to move to Chicago to be closer to my family, and there met my amazing husband, Dan. And doctors told me that all of my treatment would leave me infertile, unable to ever conceive. So it was no surprise that when we tried IVF, it unfortunately did not work. My transplant had put me in premenopause. All the chemotherapy had made an ovary shrivel up, which is just bizarre to me. And also, unbeknownst to us at the time, I was born with only half a uterus. So doctors gave us like 5% chance of ever conceiving. And we left the doctor's office heartbroken, but not defeated. Because unlike when I had cancer, we knew we had time and we knew we had options, whether it be egg donation, surrogacy, or adoption. So we went back and we did what a lot of newlyweds do, you know, and I'm not going to give you the details. I'll let you read between the lines. But just know this, that a mere two weeks later, we found out that I was pregnant. My husband likes to say that we were pregnant, but really, I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the first time that I truly felt that upwardness, weightless swing of that pendulum, because odds had told me one thing, but fate produced another. Fate produced our daughter, Sydney, and we say she was destined to be here, and she is, and she makes it known. <laughs> but like many new mothers, I suffered postpartum anxiety, anxiety that was only amplified by my complex medical history and all the unanswered questions I had that went with it. How long until my cancer returns? Will I get to take Sydney to her first day of school, send her off to college, be there on her wedding day? all of the pivotal life moments that we as parents want to be there for, for our children. And when Sydney was eight months old, I ended up in the emergency room with a three-day massive headache. I shortly after had a CT scan, and a doctor came in and told me that I had a large mass on the right side of my brain. She had suggested that my lymphoma had come back and spread there. 
I spent two weeks going to doctor upon doctor upon doctor and doing medical tests and medical exam exams. And it was concluded that there was nothing malignant lurking in my brain, but I had suffered a stroke and was epileptic because of it and had severe headaches because of it. But I did not have cancer. And during this tumultuous time, I realized that bad things can happen at, at any moment, and maybe cancer wouldn't be my undoing. And to be honest, I'm still not sure if this is a good thing or not. But during that time, it ripped open all of the wounds that were finally starting to heal, almost like a PTSD, bringing everything back. And it was a little different because I wasn't fearful of my life slowly slipping away due to an evil malignancy growing inside of me. I feared my life would be taken from me an instant, just like this, due to a massive stroke or uncontrollable seizure. It got so bad that I lost my confidence and I lost my independence. I couldn't even do day-to-day -day activities like give my daughter a bath or drive the car to the gym, let alone work out. And it wasn't until I realized that I had stopped trusting myself that led to me stop betting on myself that I was able to regain some control and just say, Katie, snap out of it. And it took some time, but I was able to do it. Now, <clears throat> after some more time, Dan and I decided that we would try and grow our family again. And we knew that the chances were slim, but we thought we'd roll the dice. And just when we thought that our number would hit seven, bam, our number hit, and we found out that I was pregnant again. We couldn't believe it. We, we couldn't believe we got lucky twice. It was a true miracle. But at 32 weeks, my brain started to bleed again. And worst of all, my seizures were getting completely out of control. A craniotomy was looking more and more necessary. So, because of that, at 34 weeks, we welcomed our son, Max. And despite Max having to spend four weeks in the NICU, he actually handled the news better than the rest of us. He's amazing. <laughs> but I had another difficult medical decision to make. Surgery or not, now or later. I'm happy to report that two weeks after Max was born, my brain stopped bleeding, and my seizures were once again under control with medicine. So I don't want to jinx myself, but maybe after all this time, I've been able to find some common ground between statistics and luck. Now, it's been nearly a decade since my first cancer diagnosis. I have since lived through a relapse, two brain bleeds, and let's be honest, two small children. And I come, keep coming back to four really important things that just keep popping up in me. And the first is this. Statistics should never dictate your outlook on life, and no one should ever give up because of them. Nothing should come with a larger, for informational purposes only, disclaimer, than statistics. And two, I've learned a lot about myself the past 10 years, but most importantly, I learned to bet on myself. And I feel like a lot of us don't do that because of self-esteem issues. Maybe we don't like the way we look. Maybe we wish we were a better athlete or further along in our career. But if we can place just one bet in our life, just one, bet on yourself. Because if you don't, who will? And three, bad things can come out of nowhere and at any time. And against all odds, I am still here. And I could choose to focus life on all those cold, hard, unforgiving facts that I've been dealt with, or I could choose to spend it on the things that make life worth living. For me, that seeing my daughter's face light up every time a Mamma Mia song comes on, which is all the time in our house, <laughs> or seeing my son's infectious laugh and hearing it every time my husband makes a silly and ridiculous face at him. These are the moments that I choose to fully absorb rather than count down how many I may have left. And last, if nothing else, life is all about balance, represented by this swinging pendulum. And luck, whether good, bad, or non-existent, is simply how we explain statistical anomalies. And life is not about how far we can get that pendulum to swing, 
but for rather how long it continues to do so. And if my grandfather, the statistician, were still alive today, I think he'd agree. Thank you.